Good morning. Hey, good morning. Happy Sunday to you all. Welcome to Marin Bible Church. So glad to see you here. Those of you who are here sitting ready, um, I'd love to welcome you to stand up and sing with us right now. Those of you in the lobby, if you can hear me, come on in and join us. Set a fire down in my 
It's a repetitive type song, but yet it speaks something so true that we should want more of you. God, you are so vast, you are so immense, so uncomprehensible, incomprehensible to our small minds. Lord, we could spend eternity, and indeed, as your children, we will spend eternity with you just discovering how great you are, the depths of your glory, the depths of your grace, the depths of your love. What an amazing God you are. Lord, we get to taste just a little bit of what heaven will be like, praising you today. Uh, Lord, Accept our praise, imperfect as it is, from grateful and loving children. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. When the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come. just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required you search much deeper
so glad I learned to trust thee, precious Jesus, Savior, friend. And I know that thou art with me, wilt be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust. We ended with a fast one. We usually go the other direction, but <laughs> God bless you for going with us. We're going to pray and uh, move on with the service. God, we thank you so much. Uh, how I trust you, Lord, that's, a, that's a, um, an encouraging thing to say, but a harder thing to do. Lord, we like to be in charge of our own lives, to push you off the throne of our lives and take care of ourselves when you know so much better how to do that. And you who love us more and know more would do it perfectly. Lord, I pray that this would be our prayer, that we would trust you to prove it over and over. Uh, in our lives. Bless us this day as we uh, lift up your name in, in song and in uh, just hearing your word preached. God, you're great, and we bless you, and we thank you uh, and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. My name is Pastor Jim. I'm one of the pastors here at Marin Bible. If this is your very first time joining us this morning, we're so glad that you're here. If you were able to pick up a gift bag on your way in, that's great. Inside that gift bag is a connection card. And if you will fill that connection card out and turn it right back into the next step station in our lobby, we'll give you a gift card in return to grab some coffee with a friend. That's a great way to show the love of Jesus to someone else. But we are just glad that you're here, and we hope the music already has pointed you in the right direction. Uh, it's so good to see all of you in here. It's so funny. We start our service off, and there's about 10 of us in the room. And I think, where is everybody? But thanks for coming in from the lobby. I appreciate that. Um, and then uh, we, we are wanting to focus. One, one thing we want to do right now is take time to just thank everyone for prayers and support for our teens being able to go to camp. And this was uh, not this last week, but the week before that, right before school started for most of our kids. Uh, the kids were able to go to Hume Lake Christian Camp. This is, my kids were able to go as well. And because of your generous support, most of our kids that wanted to go could go. We really, really appreciate that. Our church has been so generous to our teens. We appreciate that. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show a quick video, just a recap of some of the things that happened while they're at camp. And then Kyle's going to come up, say a few words as well. And then I'll give a couple announcements before we head on to the rest of our service.
All right, Kyle's coming up. I just have to highlight real quickly. So we, we had four um, guys and girls who were willing to go with these teams. That's a full week. They left Sunday morning, got back Saturday afternoon. And they, uh, so every one of them have full-time jobs. They all had to give up their jobs for that week of vacation just to go with these guys. So we had four chaperones go. Kyle, Emmanuel, stand up and just wave. You can't even see Emmanuel. He's Woo! always up there. Go, yeah, yep. And then Joy, I don't think Joy's here this morning. Oh, wait. What are you doing over there? Okay, stand up. There's Joy. And then is Danny in the room? I don't think. Danny goes to our Hispanic service down there. He plays bass sometimes. Anyway, great, great people. I cannot tell you. I had three kids that went, and they loved every second of camp, and they loved their chaperones. It was a huge part of that. So thank you guys for giving up. That's a huge sacrifice, and we appreciate that very much. Here you go. Thanks, Pastor Jim. And thanks for putting together that video. That was pretty cool. Um, so, yeah, we took a week off work. I must say, when I went back to my day job, uh, I was kind of disappointed. Uh, <laughs> I, I had a lot more fun at Hume than I do uh, at my day job, I decided. But uh, that's that. But I, I want to read a little bit of uh, scripture here that kind of um, highlights the experience at Hume Lake. And Psalm 19 is one of the verses. We had, like, uh, alone quiet time where they encouraged us to just meditate on the Word of God. And they had us read through Psalm 19. So I'm going to read a few verses here. And verse 1, Psalm 19, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tent for the sun, which comes out like a bridegroom leaving his chamber, and like a strong man runs its course with joy. Its rising is from the ends of the heavens, and its circuit to the end of them, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. I must say, being at Hume Lake, you, you get this greater sense of the heavens declaring the glory of God. I mean, if you saw some of those pictures, Hume Lake is just an absolutely incredible place to spend time. It's so beautiful. It's so quiet. There's no cell service. Yeah, yeah. So some of our teens um, have struggled with that, but this year they, they did really well, actually. So I was very, very proud of them. Uh, but we're, we're just in this place where we're constantly surrounded by the glory of God. Like, I, I struggle with that sometimes being like San Francisco for work. You know, I don't see a whole lot of the glory of God there in those city buildings. But when you go to a place that's in the woods and there's lakes and it's just so beautiful, man, it just, it is so incredible. But not only is, you know, the, the scenery beautiful, but 
Everything that Hume Lake does is centered around the gospel, centered around Christ. So I tell my youth this all the time. Like, we, they could come, you know, we meet Friday nights at 630. We could come and have the best night of all time. You know, like I think Pastor David said uh, a church had elephants in the front yard to try to attract people one time. We could have elephants. We could have a whole zoo. We could have all the fun in the world. But it means nothing if it's not centered on the gospel and centered on Christ. And Hume Lake just does such an excellent job of bringing that to light. And, you know, I said I, I struggled going back to work. I f was feeling kind of down because I'm like, you know, I'm not around like all these energetic teens. I'm around an older demographic. And, you know, it's, it's not as exciting as being around all those teenagers. But it, it made me realize that the joy that we experienced at Hume Lake was real. And the joy is a glimpse of the eternal joy that we're going to have in heaven. Like, you know, I came back to work and I was feeling kind of down and things, you know, it goes all right, but it's not the greatest thing in the world. But man, th those glimpses of glory at Hume Lake and just the joy of being with like-minded people and people who are focused on Jesus and just having fun, man, we're going to have that in its fullness for eternity. And I so look forward to that. And so I want to put a plug for Friday nights. We meet each night, uh, each Friday night, 6.30 at the gym over here, usually about 6.30 to 8.30. Thanks for throwing that up. Um, it's just a, such a blessed time where we do the same thing. We like to have fun, but we like to always center it around the gospel and around Christ. So if you have teens that are 6th grade to 12th grade, we'd love to have them come. Um, if you're an adult that's plugged into the church and you want to get plugged into the youth group, please come and talk to me. We'd be happy to have some more volunteers and help out. So thank you all for your prayers, for your support. Um, you made this possible, so we thank you very much. Thank you, Kyle. Appreciate that. Okay, two quick things. If you are visiting our church in the last few weeks, you've never had a chance to really talk to Pastor David or I or learn about the church a little bit, we're going to have a light luncheon right after the service next Sunday, and that'll be here in our courtyard area. So just outside these doors, there's a courtyard. It's a meet the pastor's luncheon. You do not have to stay very long. You can just step in, grab a bite, say hello. We just want to tell you a little bit about the church and about ourselves, get to know you a little bit. So if that's something you're interested in, we would love for you to be there. If you could sign up in the lobby at our next step station over here, there's a sign-up sheet. And then if you get our newsletter every week, you'll see there's digital sign-ups in there as well. You can do that as well. So remember that. And then just to keep in mind, since we're talking about youth, uh, I don't think we have a slide for this yet, but um, September 9th. So that's three weeks away on a Friday night. That's our kickoff for Fall Family Night. And that's anybody with kids in their home. I mean, not like a 30-year-old kid, but like a kid in their home. Teens and all the way down to babies. If you want to come join us, we're going to have free food, prizes, games, and teaching time for our every age demographic as well. And that's just to bring all of our families together, all the parents of our church to say, hey, we support you, we love you, and we want to bless you. So that's September the 9th of Friday at 6.30 p.m. We'll say more about that later. Okay. I'm helping out with Valley Kids, which is one of my favorite things to do, our NBC Kids program, and I'll be meeting kids in the lobby along with some other people. So if you would, let's stand together. Just say hello to one or two people real quickly, and then uh, you can dismiss kids as well, fifth grade and below, fifth grade and below. Okay, 
If you can go ahead and find your seats, we're going to do the scripture reading this morning. Um, you can actually remain standing once you get back to your uh, designated pew. Okay. And let's go ahead and stand for the reading of God's word this morning. Revelation chapter 22, verses 10 and 11. And he said to me, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. Let the evildoer still do evil, and the filthy still be filthy, and the righteous still do right, and the holy still be holy. This has been the reading of God's word. You may be seated. Good morning. It's good to see you all. Boy, it's not, that air conditioning is nice after this hot week, isn't it? Uh, we don't have air conditioning at our place, so it's nice. To, uh, another reason to come to church on Sundays. To get nice air conditioning. Um, so I, I want to start out this morning. We're winding down the book of Revelation, and we're looking at the seven last invitations that God gives us. So we're on number three today, and we've looked at an invitation to, um, uh, to obey God's word, to worship him alone, and we looked at seven reasons, uh, seven different ways to obey him. And then in this invitation this week, I've entitled it to be holy. It's an invitation to be like Jesus. And so last week, we, we looked at the uh, Ten Commandments, and this week, we're going to see how the Ten Commandments are still... Um, something that I think we need to live by today and are reiterated in the New Testament. So I want to continue on that vein, but, but one thing I, want to, I just want to open up with, I think it's really interesting how uh, just how life works and how God works providentially. And three weeks in a row now, I've been able to share the gospel with different people in different locations, in my home, on the golf course, uh, and in the community. And three different weeks in a row now, I've had people say to me, after they hear uh, some kind of presentation of the gospel that I've given, and, and probably what I say more than anything else is when people ask me, what's the Bible about, or what is Christianity about, I try to uh, say it within, f use four words, four concepts that the Bible teaches. And one is creation. I start with creation, and when we finish the book of Revelation, we're actually going to spend a few years studying the book of Genesis because the uh, book of Genesis is 50 chapters, Revelation's 22 chapters, and we've spent uh, a, about a year and a half in Revelation. So if you do the math, 50 chapters, Genesis, 22 chapters, Revelation, that means at least two or three years in Genesis. And again, I hope that we don't even get to finish Genesis, that Jesus returns before we finish it, okay? But if he tarries... Uh, we're going to wade through Genesis, and I'm really excited about it. And, uh, but, but Genesis starts with creation, and creation is one of the key words in understanding the gospel, that God created us to have a relationship with him, and that he's designed life on planet Earth unlike anywhere in the universe for us to, to sustain our lives, but also to have purpose in this life. What ruined his creation was us, was the fall. So creation led to the fall, which is all the ramifications of the suffering in the world, evil in the world, and just uh, how hard it is to work, how hard it is to get along, how hard it is to not sin are a result of the fall. So you have creation and then you have the fall, but then Jesus provided a way um, for us to be redeemed, and so redemption is a third word, creation, fall, redemption. And then when we're redeemed, what God wants to do is he wants to restore what's fallen. And so one day he's going to restore the whole universe because all of the universe and all creation groans to be liberated from its fallenness. And you and I groan to be liberated from our battle with the world, the flesh, and the devil. 
So when I, when I share that and share how we can know God and how we can be redeemed through Jesus Christ, be forgiven of all our sin, and one day be restored, what I've heard three times in the last three weeks from three different people is, what if you're wrong? What if what you believe isn't true? And I want to start off today because uh, uh, here's what's interesting about Christianity is I grew up in, a, in a, what I would call a Christian home because my parents both were followers of Jesus Christ. And I've said this many times that, that even if I didn't know anything about Christianity, if I never read the Bible, I would want to be a Christian because my parents' life was exactly what I wanted. They had a great relationship. I never saw them fight. I know they have, but I never saw them fight. Um, they, they got along just incredibly well, loved each other to pieces, were married 68 years before uh, they both got dementia, and my dad had Alzheimer's, and they've died within the last uh, six years. Um, but even if I didn't know anything about Christianity, I would want to be a Christianity just on the basis of what they modeled for me and taught for me and how they lived. And it's sort of like what you described at camp, Kyle. My home, everybody in our, on our street wanted to be in our house because, for one, it's where the best food was. Okay, my mom was a great cook, and she loved to have people over. And it was not rare for my friends to show up at midnight because they knew my mom was up late. They knew I was up late. We were, we're Argentinians, so we have that Latin American culture where you stay up late and sometimes we eat dinner at 10 and then you have your midnight snack and then sometimes even after that you're still eating and so my friends would show up at the door at midnight and my mom would welcome them oh come on in you guys want a banana split and they're like yeah you know we'd be eating banana split and we'd be playing baseball in the living room because we had a huge room uh, and we we had a wiffle I had a wiffle ball and and wiffle bat and we'd play baseball in the living room and we had all these area you know one area where you hit it to was a triple another area was a double another area a home run we'd be playing baseball at midnight eating uh, ice cream Sundays our house was the place to be we had fun but at the same time if you came into our house you were going to hear about Jesus. Uh, Jesus was talked about every day. Jesus was sung to every day. Jesus was danced to every day by my mom, especially. Um, and it was just a fun place to be. And, and, and when I looked at other uh, friends of mine and the relationships that they had in their homes and the broken relationships and the divorces and the abuse, if all I had was just what was modeled for me, I would be a Christian. However, when I, when I was a freshman in college, um, I, was, uh, I, I was for the first time in a totally secular environment, and almost all my teachers, as a matter of fact, the first two teachers I had my history, my world civilization professor, and my English lit teacher, both of them in the same day, in the first two classes I had in the public school uh, college, both said, my goal is if you're a Christian to destroy your faith in this class. Didn't have anything to do with history, didn't have anything to do with English literature, but that was the goal of the teachers. So I immediately faced sort of the, the movie series, God is Not Dead. I, I experienced that as a college student, that my first two professors wanted to destroy my faith. And so what happened at that time, and I had already started earlier on that because I was sharing the gospel and sharing about Jesus with a lot of people, even as an elementary school student, as a teenager, I loved Jesus, I wanted people to know Jesus. But my first year of college, I decided to read the main books of the main religions of the world. So I read the Quran that year, the Book of Islam, I read the Bhagavad Gita and the Vedas and several of the writings of the, of the East. Um, I even read cults writings like the Book of Mormon and, uh, and the Jehovah's Witnesses, um, so-called Bible, and so forth. And I read these and I debated with people and I was in charge of the debate team that where we brought atheists and evolutionists and so forth to debate creationists and, and, and that on campus. And we brought Christian bands, and I was involved in a lot of evangelism. But in that year, what I wanted to do is I wanted to go, okay, I grew up in this, I'm socialized in this, I believe in this, but why? And do I own my parents' faith? Do I believe what they believe just because they said so? 
or are there reasons for this? Are there evidences for this? And here's what I want to say to you is when people ask me this, and again, three times in the last three weeks, what if you're wrong? Inside, I laugh. <laughs> and it's a laughter of, I'm 99.999% certain that I'm right <laughs> and that this is true. And as I've compared it for now being a Christian for 49 years, since I was six years old, uh, the more I study, and I study a lot, and the more I read, and I read a lot, and the more I talk to people, and I talk to a lot of people, and the more I defend Christianity, and the more I see what everybody else has to offer, the more convinced I am today than I've ever been that this is true. So, if we're wrong, if I'm wrong, then what? And here's what I would say. Here's what I do say to people who say, well, what if you're wrong? If I am wrong, I don't feel like I've lost very much at all. Because as I look at, I look at the family I grew up in, I look at my marriage relationship, I look at what I have in our church, I look at the community that I have with other Christians. And if it wasn't true, I look at what my life, how messed up my life if I wasn't influenced by Christianity and around Christians. And there's nothing at all that the world has to offer that I want. That's me. Okay, that's, that's just me. But the reason I'm a Christian and the reason I don't believe I'm wrong or we're wrong if you, if you claim to be a Christian is because the evidence of its truth is overwhelming. And anything opposed to it is not only underwhelming, but contradictory and doesn't work. So what I want to say is not only, I don't have the time today, but as, I, as we're going through Genesis, I believe that a lot of what we face, the symptomatic problems that result from the foundation of what you believe and why you believe it, start with, the way the Bible starts, where it says, in the beginning, God. And if your foundation in your beginning of your thinking isn't God, you're in trouble. And the world's starting point, and the reason I have, I have three books that are over 400 pages long, that have scientist after scientist after scientist after scientist that has lost their job, lost tenure, has been fined and in some cases imprisoned for teaching anything in opposition to evolution. Three books, 400 pages. The guy who's writing these books himself was fired from Wayne State in Detroit, Michigan because he opposed evolution just by appealing to intelligent design. Not even appealing to the Bible, but just saying, wow, this, studying the eye appears to be incredibly designed. And he got fired for that. And so we live in a world, if you're a Christian, I just want you to know that we stand out in a lot of ways. <laughs> One of those is our opposition to evolution, but another way is the opposition that people oppose us because of our lifestyle. And we have been called, once you're a Christian, to be holy, to be set apart, to be different. That your lifestyle, your morality, your ethics should be different than non-believers. And one of the things I love about, you know, people will throw out the crusades at us or whatever. But the reality is, if you look at anybody that applies the Bible, I can't name a single atheist that started an orphanage. I can't name a single atheist. If you know of somebody, let me know. Because I've never, I've never been, I've done research, I've never found out any atheist that started an orphanage. I don't know of an atheist that started a hospital. But I can name thousands and into the hundred thousands of orphanages and schools and hospitals that have been started by Christians. And when you do things the way God says to do them, whatever it touches, whatever the subject, I just want you to know from experience, it works. And if you do it in opposition to God's way, it never works. And so just on a practical level, I believe Christianity is true. But beyond that, the reason we study the scriptures is because the scriptures reveal God's revelation of himself and what he's like to us. And one of the, one of the ways he does that is through his law. His law represents his morality. 
And because God is eternal, and because God cannot change, his morality never changes. So the biggest mistakes churches are doing today is they're accepting unbiblical morality and saying we have to conform to culture. But when you do that, that means you're unconforming to God. You're deconforming and you're deconstructing the way God constructed you, designed you to be. So we can never abandon the law of God because the law of God represents who God is, his character and his nature. So what I want to do today as we look at verses 10 and 11 of Revelation, again, if you look at the top of your outlines, um, in verses 10 and 11, this is the angel talking to John. He's getting his last vision in the last chapter of the Bible. We're looking at seven invitations. The third invitation is right here, but he says, do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is near. And again, what that means is, from when Jesus ascended into heaven until he comes back, you got to remember that for God, because he's an eternal being and he's outside of time, time doesn't really factor with him because he knows everything perfectly now in the present. We have to wait for what's to come, but because God is all-knowing, he knows what's coming, and he's planning what's coming, and he's sovereign over that, and he knows all past history. And from the time in Genesis 1-1 where it says, in the beginning, God. Before there was anything else but God, God knows the history of everything that he's going to make in the past, in the future, and now at one time. Okay, that's mind-boggling, isn't it? We can't do that. As a matter of fact, we always have to learn, and I don't know about you, I always feel behind. It seems like any time I catch up, there's something new I need to learn about. And it's like you're constantly just drinking from a fire hose, and then you think you caught up in something new's out there, and it's like, oh, man, now i got to learn about this. But God never learns anything. He knows everything. He not only knows everything as is, he knows every potentiality based on if all of us chose to not be here today, he knows what the ramifications would be of that. The fact that we are here today, he knows the ramifications of that. And on and on it goes. God is amazing. But what I want you to see here is he says, do not seal up the prophecy of this book for the time is near. And what he means is that the time of Jesus' appearing, his coming back, is going to happen suddenly. That's what that term means, immediately. And in between his ascension to heaven and his return, in God's perspective of eternity, of being an eternal being, it's going to happen quickly. But from our perspective, we don't know where that's going to be. But when it happens, it's going to be sudden. That's why if you're not right with God, the chances are there's a possibility you could die today. And there's a possibility that you may not die, but Jesus may return today. That possibility is real. Are you ready? Are you ready? And so we have to, as Christians, live in this this uh, ethos, this atmosphere of the fact that Jesus can return at any time and I could die at any time. So my days are numbered, my time is limited. So I need to focus, I need to hone in, I need to eliminate what's chaff, what's not going to last forever. I need to hone in and focus on what's going to last because the time is near. In other words, Jesus can come back today. And then he says, let the evildoers still do evil and the filthy still be filthy. And that's anybody who's outside of Christ is in that category. And then the righteous still do right and the holy still be holy. And that's anybody who's in Christ. And those are the only two types of people in the world. You're either evil. And again, if you're a sinner and you have not repented of your sin and put your trust in God, God will punish you for your sin. He will. He promises that. That's a promise. That will be fulfilled. That's that's what awaits you. That's your default mode. The only way to get out of your default mode of a one-way ticket to hell is Jesus Christ. He's the only ticket out of hell. And he's the only ticket for you that will, will prevent God from punishing you eternally for your sin and because of your sin and your rebellion against him. And the Bible is very clear about that. So the only way out of hell is Christ. It's not death. A lot of Americans think, yeah, I'm going to go to heaven when I die. Why? Well, I'm a good person. I never killed anybody. 
But the reality is when you compare yourself, you can compare yourself with other people and always find people worse off than you, but the comparison isn't between you and other people. The comparison is between you and God. And what breaks your fellowship with God is your sin and my sin. And that's why we need Jesus. So the invitation here is for those of you who are Christians, and I hope you all are, but if you're not, I hope you'll become a Christian today. And I hope you'll repent of your sin and you'll put your trust in Christ and you'll believe as I'm proclaiming that this is true. It's objectively true, not just for you, but for everyone. There's only one God. There's only one way. There's only one way out of hell. There's only way one, one way into heaven and it's all through Jesus. Amen? Okay, so... When we get to, uh, we're going to get to holiness in a second, but I at least want to read from Daniel Aiken. He sort of describes what's going on here in the immediate passage. And then I want to immediately focus after that on application by going to how the Ten Commandments come into the New Testament and what that means for us today and living a righteous life and a holy life before a holy and righteous God. So under number one there, these two paragraphs, just follow along as I read. This is from Daniel Aiken's commentary, Exalting Jesus in Revelation. He says, unlike the prophet Daniel, who was told in Daniel 12, 4, keep these words secret and seal the book until the time of the end, John is told don't seal the prophetic words of this book. Why is his command different? Because the time is near. Christ could return at any moment. Eternity is drawing closer. For all of us, it is only a heartbeat away. We dare not silence the word of God by disobedience, indifference, laziness, or neglect. We must preach it and teach it continually and faithfully. A time is coming when the opportunity to respond to the gospel and the word of God will be no more. Verse 11 echoes Daniel 12, 9 through 10, which says, Go on your way, Daniel, for the words are secret and sealed until the time of the end. Many will be purified, cleansed, and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly. None of the wicked will understand, but the wise will understand. So Revelation 12, 11 contains four commands that serve as warnings and encouragement. It affirms that a day is coming when change will not, no longer be possible, that it is true eschatologically, but it is also true personally. How we respond to the truth of God's word in this life will confirm our character and determine our destiny for all eternity. Negatively, the unrighteous will still do evil, and the filthy will forever be filthy. On a positive note, the righteous will still do right, and the holy will still be holy. One's character will be set forever fixed in a final condition and disposition. Those in hell will have no heart and passion for God. Those in heaven will delight in their emulation of their Lord. These truths must be told. We dare not be silent. Souls are at stake. And eternal destinies hang in the balance. So getting back to my introduction, when people say to me, what if you're wrong? I, I come back and I say, well, if I'm wrong... I don't really believe I've lost very much, if anything at all. But if you're wrong, your destiny is hell forever. And once you die, there's no second chances. Yet you're stuck in hell forever. And so you have everything to lose if this is true. If Christianity is true, if what the Bible says is true, that means that if you do not repent of your sin and put your trust in Christ, you have everything to lose in eternity. Not only that, you're losing a lot in life because you're not living for that which lasts and matters for eternity. And thus, that's why so many people, the, the highest cause of death around the world for teenagers now is suicide. Why is that? I think it's very simple. If you're taught you came from slime and you're going to slime and there's no purpose in life, well, what's the, po what's the point? Why even live? But the Bible says there is a point. <laughs> we've come, we were, we were made by God to have a relationship with God, a God who loves us. As a matter of fact, he loves us so much, he died on the cross for our sins. Jesus died. He came to die because he loves you that much that he would die for your sins so you never have to be punished for your sins. 
And the purpose of life is to know him and have fellowship with him and have joy in him and satisfaction in him and do what he tells you to do because it works. And so life has purpose and meaning. And then in the end, we will be rewarded for those things that we did for him. And so life has purpose, life has meaning because the Bible, what the Bible says, I believe is true. And if you don't believe in the Bible is true, that means that life doesn't have meaning. It doesn't have purpose. And whoever the elites are, whoever has the most money and the most power rules. But even now, though the elites rule, they're under God. And they will one day answer to God. And I hope... I pray that God will give us another revival before Jesus returns. Now, the Christian in law, I want to go through this quickly, um, but I, w one of the things I hope that you understand is I, I talked with somebody, I don't see them here, I don't think they're here today, but I saw somebody at the senior luncheon this week uh, that asked me about the Sabbath. And they said, how come we worship on Sundays and not on the Sabbath? And they had a background in the Seventh-day Adventist church. So we're going to answer that question. I'm not going to answer it right now. But we're going to answer it before we finish. Um, but, but I want you to see that there's a lot of confusion over the law in the Old Testament. And how does the law work in the New Testament? What I hope to at least help you a little bit more to understand that today is that uh, the law in the Old Testament, there's 643 different laws to obey. That's a lot. And if I asked you even to get out a sheet of paper right now, hopefully most of you could, could write down the Ten Commandments. But some of you couldn't even do that. But if I asked you to write down the 643 laws in the Old Testament, I bet you that few of you would be able to come up with over 20. As a matter of fact, prove me wrong. Okay? This week, don't cheat. Don't cheat. But just go home, don't even open your Bible, get out a legal pad, and try to come up with 20 laws from the Old Testament. Try, try it. I dare you. And I want to see how far you get. Okay, just do it for fun. Uh, but the reality is there's 643 laws that were to be obeyed in the Old Testament. Now, one of the things that you need to understand is that God works in different ways at different times. And there's progression in truth and its development. And those of you who are in the theology class, this last week we talked about the Trinity. And we, we talked about if you never read the New Testament... How clear would you be on the Trinity from the Old Testament? And, and all I have to say is, there's no way you would be as clear on the Trinity if all you had was the Old Testament. Now, can you see the Trinity in the Old Testament? Do you see the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament? What's the answer? Yes. Do you see Jesus in the Old Testament? What's the answer? Yes. Do you see God, Yahweh, who we call the Father in the New Testament, in the Old Testament? Yes, but do you see more clarity of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit and their roles in the New Testament? What's the answer? Yes. Okay, if you only have the Old Testament, do you come up with the millennial kingdom? You come up with a kingdom. Do you come up with a thousand-year kingdom in the Old Testament? What's the answer? No. Okay, so in other words, if you take any area of theology, whether it's end times, the Holy Spirit, Jesus, salvation, if you come up with any the area of theology, the old in the Old Testament, a lot of this is contained, but in the New Testament, it's explained. In the Old Testament, it's concealed. In the New Testament, it's revealed. And again, when you take the whole Old and New Testament together on any area of theology, it's like if all you have is the Old Testament, you have a bunch of pieces of the puzzle, but then when you come to the New Testament, you're able to put it all together. And so it's important that we know both. We know the Old Testament and we know the New Testament. And we know how the New Testament fulfills that which is prophesied or promised in the Old Testament. But if all we have is the Old Testament, it's hard for us to really develop a full-fledged doctrine of the Trinity. It's hard for us to develop a full-fledged doctrine of the law. And so what I want to do is I just want to show you that Jesus is very interesting when he talks about the law in the New Testament. So follow along on the bottom of page one. I'm going to read through this. Um, and, and the first thing I want you to know is that in the New Testament makes very clear that the Christian is not under the law, but lives in the sphere of grace. 
And that's the progress of revelation. It doesn't mean we're not supposed to obey certain laws and certain principles, especially if they're reiterated in the New Testament. Here's what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 6, 11 through 14. He says, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God to those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. Galatians 5.18, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So what he's saying secondly here is that in Christ, we died to the law and have be, been delivered from the law. We must not become uh, entangled again in the bondage of the law, which means falling out of the sphere of grace and living like a slave rather than a son. And so Paul explains this in Galatians 5, 1 through 6. He says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision uncirc counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Now, I want to clearly articulate what Paul's saying in both Romans and Galatians. He's saying this. Without, if you don't have Christ in the mix, if he's not a puzzle piece that's available to you, what you're trying to do is you're trying to obey the law. And he's saying, as you're trying to obey the law, there's two problems. One, you can't do it. And the other, because you can't do it, you're going to be judged for the fact that you can't do it. And that means that you will be punished by God forever. That's the bad news. The good news, enter Jesus. Now bring Jesus into you. Now you're able to play Jesus in the puzzle. He completes it because what he does is he completely fulfills all 643 commands perfectly. Not only does he do that, there's two aspects to the law. There's not only not disobeying the law, then there's the fact of obeying the law. And there's sins of omission. That is like a lot of us are guilty of the sin of omission where we're told to, we're commanded to pray. We're commanded to read our Bibles. We're commanded to evangelize. We're commanded to make disciples. And some of us haven't done that. Some of us haven't done that at all. I mean, it, it's surprising to me how few Christians have led another person to Christ. Even though before Jesus comes back, that needs to be our number one thing that we're about. Sharing the good news with others. And so, not only, uh, you know, sometimes we think we're good because, well, you know, I, I, I don't steal, I don't lie, I don't do this, I don't do that. However, on the flip side of that, what do you do? <laughs> How do you spend your time? How effective is a Christian that knows the law and doesn't break the law but sits in their lazy boy for 24 hours a day and never talks to anybody and never serves anyone? Yeah, they're not sinning in the sense of, breaking the law to some extent, although I think they are, because there, there's something they're worshiping other than God in the process of being in that lazy boy. But, but the reality is we need to t think in terms of holiness isn't just not disobeying the law. Holiness also is fulfilling what the law was given us to do, which is to live for Jesus and his glory and that which is going to last forever. In other words, how you spend your time is as important as not breaking the law. Does that make sense? Okay, so, continuing, bullet point under Galatians 5, 1 through 6. Does this mean that the Christian is supposed to be lawless and ignore the holy demands of God? Of course not. This is the accusation Paul's enemies threw at him because he emphasized... Um, the believer's glorious position in Christ in Romans 6.1. 
2 Corinthians 3 makes it clear that the glory of the gospel of God's grace far surpasses the temporary glory of the Old Testament law, and that we Christians go from glory to glory as we grow in grace. Actually, the New, New Testament Christian is under a more demanding way of life than the Old Testament believer, for the Old Testament law dealt with outward acts, while the New Testament law of love deals with inward attitudes and inward realities. Being free from the law does not mean being free to sin. Liberty is not license. We have been called to liberty, and we must use that liberty for good, the good of others, and the glory of God, according to Galatians 5, 13 to 26. We are under the higher law of love, the law of Christ. And so, if you look at the Old Testament, the, the way the Pharisees did, for instance, is they said, we're obeying the law. We're doing what the law says. And Jesus looks at them and he says, inside you, you're dirty. Inside you, you're wicked. Inside you, you're evil. And so they were doing the external acts, but what was their motivation? Did they love Christ? Well, obviously not, because they're the first ones to shout, crucify him. And so what I think is, if you're a Christian today, how do you apply the Old Testament law and how does that apply in the New Testament? Very simply, Jesus boils it down to one thing. You love God, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself. And if you do those two things, you fulfill all the law. What's the key? You understand that Jesus fulfilled the law for you and you can't. And out of appreciation for what he's done for you, you say, I want to love what you love, and I want to hate what you hate, and I want to be like you. And it's, the law isn't burdensome. I love the law of God, because the law of God actually liberates you. See, a lot of people look at the law of God and go, oh man, what a killjoy God is. Look at all the... Have you ever thought about how much money is made on sexual immorality? Uh, pornography is a trillion dollar industry worldwide. Sex trafficking is probably in the billions. Yeah, oftentimes those two go together, but, but again, if you take every single sexual act and the cost of it, not just monetarily, but how it ruins lives. The abuse, the drug addiction, all the things that go with things when you go away from God's design. Just think, if you think of the Ten Commandments, and you just think, if everybody just obeyed the Ten Commandments, but not because they have to, but because they want to, what kind of a world would this be? Can you imagine if there was no divorce, and people were married for life, and they were faithful to each other. And the man never looked for sexual gratification out of that relationship with his wife, and vice versa. No abortion clinics, no sexually transmitted diseases, no pornography, no sex trafficking. All these things would be eliminated. Why? Because we do things God's way, by God's design. And it works. And that's just one example. But if you take all the Ten Commandments, and everybody just did those, but not because they have to, but out of a life transformed because it's like, wow, I can't believe that Jesus lived this for me, and he was punished in my behalf. And he did that to liberate me from this sin and this chaos that the world offers. And if everybody did it God's way, it would be heaven. Now, one day, it is going to be that way. <laughs> In heaven, it is going to be like that. Everybody will obey all the commandments perfectly, and because you want to, and you can't even break the laws because you no longer have a sin nature. Amen? Amen. So we're going to experience that someday. But before that, we battle the world, the flesh, and the devil. And how we battle that is with a great understanding of why did God save us in the first place? He wants to redeem us, and he wants to restore us. And he does not want to live the way of the world because the way of the world doesn't work and it's destructive and it will kill you. And ultimately, it does kill you. Why do we die? The wages of sin is 
death. So this is reality. This is the reality we find ourselves in. So let me uh, continue. The second to the last bullet point there before number three. We do not try to obey God in the energy of the flesh because this is impossible. The flesh is sinful and weak and cannot submit to the law. But as we reckon ourselves dead to sin and yield to the Holy Spirit, the Spirit fulfills the law in us and through us. In other words, we do the law, we obey the law naturally or supernaturally through the Holy Spirit who lives in us when we're saved. When we're not saved, we can't do it. We don't have the ability to do it. We don't have the help to do it. So to go back to the law is to exchange reality for shadows and liberty for bondage. It is to forfeit the high calling we have in grace. Law means that we must do something to please God. Grace means that God works in us to fulfill his perfect will. So the Ten Commandments today. Let's look at how the commandments work today. All of the Old Testament law is but an amplification and application of the Ten Commandments. Nine of the Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament for believers today. So the first commandment, have no other gods before me. In John 4, 21 to 26, this is a story of Jesus with a Samaritan woman. And I, I always read this with fondness because some of you know the story of when I went to Israel. I've only been to Israel once, and when I went... Um, I sat ne next, next to a lady who was working on her PhD in feminism studies. She was from Palestine in Israel, and she was, a, uh, she was a Muslim, and she was studying at the University of Chicago working on her PhD in feminis feminism studies. I happened to have my Greek New Testament for some reason. I, I had that out, and I was reading my Greek New Testament, and she said, what language is that? And I said, well, it's Koine Greek. It's a dead language, but it's, it's the language that God used, the common language of the people at the time, uh, just like English is sort of the language of business and commerce around the world today. That's the way Greek was when it was written, in, when the New Testament was written. And, um, and I happened to be reading John 4. And I said, oh, so feminism studies, so I, got, so I said, I bet you're learning a lot about Jesus. And she looked at me and she was like, yeah, like I was from another planet, you know. And she goes, no, she goes, actually, we haven't heard anything about Jesus. And I said, really? I go, that's amazing to me. You know, you're studying, you're working on your PhD in feminism studies, and the greatest liberator of all time for women was Jesus, and they're not talking about him? And she was like, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, let me read you the passage I'm reading here. And I read to her the story of Jesus with a Samaritan woman. And then she was fascinated by that, so then I went over to John 8 and read to her about the woman caught in adultery. And then I read how he treated Mary and Martha. And so I read her these stories, and tears came to her eyes. And she was blown away. And, um, and, and so, so anyway, here, here's somebody who is a Muslim and a feminist, like probably two things that stereotypically would be something I'm not going to get very far with this woman. <laughs> but all I did was I just pointed her right to Jesus. And her, and her heart melted. And I was like, this is what I long for. I long to be treated the way Jesus tr treated these women. That's what I long for my people. And see, Jesus, I don't care where you're coming from, I don't care what you believe, I don't care what you've done. The answer for you is Jesus. Jesus will liberate you. Jesus will give you abundant life. Jesus will give you peace. Jesus will comfort you. Jesus will give you everything you long for. But you have to set aside your idols. You have to set aside those things that you put before him. And Jesus will make all the difference in the world. So anyway, this passage from John 4, um, the Samaritan woman's talking, and she's talking to Jesus, and she says, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship in spirit 
and truth. And the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called the Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Wow. <laughs> wow. Jesus is the same today, yesterday, and forever. When Jesus speaks, he is salvation. When Jesus speaks, he is Lord. When Jesus speaks, he is truth. And unlike E.F. Hutton, <laughs> unfortunately, when Jesus talks, a lot of people don't listen, but you should. Because to worship God means to worship Jesus. 1 Timothy 2, 5 for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. The only way to be right with God is through Jesus Christ. James 2.19 says, you have faith and have works. Show me your faith apart from works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. You know that a lot of demons have better theology than a lot of the preachers out there today. But it's not enough to just believe that God exists. You know, the demons know that Jesus was crucified. The, G the demons know that Jesus resurrected. The, Jesus, the demons know that Jesus is coming back. The demons know that what awaits them is an eternity in hell separated from God forever. But they still are on a mission of evil. And wherever you're at, the, the important thing is not only that you believe what God did and who God is, but are you committed to him? Do you love him? Do you live for him? Is the evidence of your life such that nobody would doubt for a moment that you're a Christian? By your character, by your behavior, and the only way people know that is if you're holy and righteous, or are you like everybody else in the world, just living in sin? So God saved us to liberate us, but we're not saved because of our good works. He did the good works so we can walk in those good works. And we could be beneficiaries of the fact that the law is good and that it works. 1 Corinthians 8, 6, Yet there is one God, the Father, from whom all things are, for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. Here we see all the members of the Trinity. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God. He's talking about the Father. We know that from the context. And the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. That's how he closes Corinthians. And then the Great Commission, part of the Great Commission. Baptizing them in the, you'd think it'd say names, but because God is one in essence, but three in person. He says name, singular, but in that singular God exists the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So what we have in the New Testament is the completion. To not worship any other gods means that the God we worship is triune. And he's revealed himself in both the Old and the New Testament. And when you talk to Jews, I love talking to Jews about this. Um, I, I, I'm able to, to use this and I'm able to go back into the Old Testament. And I'm able to show them. The Holy Spirit and I'm able to show them who the Father is and I'm able to show them who the Son is and if they're open many times they see this and one of the greatest privileges I've had in my life is leading somebody who survived Auschwitz to Christ in his 90s at his deathbed and and I read Isaiah 53 to him and I showed how the Father the Son and the Spirit work in in that passage which is 700 years before Jesus came Crucifixion hadn't been invented yet by the Romans, and yet you read Isaiah 53, and it's like, a, it's like a day after the crucifixion account of what happened. And, the, and the, this old man who survived Auschwitz was crying, and he said, how come my rabbi never read this to me? And I go, I don't know. He should have. <laughs> but, but Jesus is everywhere. Jesus is, is all through here, and so you cannot... Uh, so. How do we worship God today? Well, the same way people got saved in the Old Testament, how did they get saved? They needed to look forward to Jesus. They needed to put their trust in Jesus, just like we look backward to Jesus by faith. But did he really come? Did he really die? Did he really rise from the dead? I believe yes. I believe the evidence is overwhelming. A second thing, a second thing we see in the New Testament is we see that the second commandment is reiterated again. Make no idols or images of God. 
in Paul's famous speech at the Areopagus in Athens. He says, being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to what? Repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. Who is that man? Jesus. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. And so what he's saying then, if you want to be saved, don't look to anything else. Look to Jesus. He's the one who was appointed by God to judge the world. Why? Because he lived the perfect life, and if you didn't live the perfect life, that's okay because he did it for you. But you need to repent of anything you're putting in your trust in other than him, and if you repent and believe in him, you will be saved. And what's the guarantee of that? He raised him from the dead. He's the first fruits. You also are going to rise from the dead, and you're either going to be judged in your sins, or you're going to be judged on the basis of what Christ did for you and your reception of him. Romans 1, 22 and 23, claiming to be wise, they became fools. These are people who, who see the glory of God, the creation, the passage that uh, Kyle read from earlier, from Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. They, de they declare his handiwork. But we don't worship the creation. We see the creation as something beautiful that he's made, and therefore it leads us to worship him for the beauty he's made for the goodness he's revealed about him. But fools worship the creation rather than the creator. That's the evolutionist. The evolutionist primarily worships man, not God. And so if your premise is man and you eliminate God, you're in big trouble. Everything else that follows is, is going to be nothing but bad because you've eliminated the whole reason, the whole purpose for which you exist, to know God and to make him known and to be like him. You eliminate God, you're in big trouble. Now, he is the true God in eternal life. Little children, keep yourself from idols. So worship the real God. And then um, Matthew 5, 27 and 30, you have, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped uh, a whole section there. Number four, or number three, do not take his name in vain. And in the Old Testament, this is sort of defined by oaths, and we see that repeated in the New Testament. But this is sort of like you've seen movies before where somebody's in a rock, between a rock and a hard place. You know, he's in a bad situation. And so he's never talked to God before. And it reminds me of, of an atheist who was on top of a ledge, a high ledge, and he slipped. And it was a high cliff, and he, before he fell, uh, uh, you know, to his for certain death, he grabbed onto a branch, and he said, if there's anything, if there's anybody up there, please help me. And he heard a voice, and the voice said, let go of the branch. And he said, is there anybody else up there that can help me? <laughs> <laughs> but what you see sometimes in movies is you'll see, you'll see somebody who's in a dire straits position, has had nothing to do with God, but then he makes this, this claim, God, if you get me out of this, I'll start going to church. God, if you get me out of this, I'll, I'll stop stealing. I'll stop, you know, whatever. They make some, that's, that's what this is talking about. It's somebody saying to God or claiming something about God, but God knows they're not going to hold to it. it. It's just said to get out of a bad situation. So James 5, 12 repeats this about not taking God's name in vain. In other words, not using God's name in a way that honors him, that pleases him. That serves him. That's about him. It's really for your own ends. You're using God. So above all, brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that uh, you may not fail, uh, fall under condemnation. And then Matthew 5, 33 and 37, again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord and what you have sworn but I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. And so 
God knows our hearts. God knows what we're thinking. God knows what we says. And if we're, obey, if we're truly be obeying, obeying the law, if we're doing what God wants us to do, it's out of a heart of love for him. If it's anything else, he knows our motives are false. And it's, it's basically meaningless other than the fact that it just shows how much we need Jesus. Then number four, this is interesting because this is the only one of the Ten Commandments that is not repeated in the New Testament. And I'm going to close with this when we do communion in, in a few minutes here. But this, uh, this is Warren Wiersbe. He says, this is not repeated anywhere in the New Testament for the church to obey today. Keeping the Sabbath is mentioned in Matthew 12, Mark 2, Luke 6, and John 5. But these all refer to the people of Israel and not to the church. Colossians 2 and Romans 14 and 15 teach that believers should not judge one another with reference to holy days or Sabbaths. To say that a person is lost or unspiritual for not keeping the Sabbath is to go beyond the bounds of Scripture. And what's interesting is, again, we're never, it's never reminded to the church or to Christians to keep the Sabbath. But what happened was in the New Covenant, when Jesus rose from the dead, the disciples no longer were meeting on the Sabbath. They were meeting on Sunday, which we call the Lord's Day, which was the result of the greatest event in the history of the world when Jesus rose again. And so since that time, uh, Christians meet on Sundays, the Lord's Day. But it's interesting that the Sabbath is the only day that's not, the only commandment that's not repeated in the New Testament. And what that means is Jews, Muslims, atheists, agnostics, anybody listen up. You need to worship God to celebrate the resurrection. Jesus rose again and he's coming back. And the only way to be ready for his coming is you need to know him. And so we, the, the day was changed from Sabbath to the Lord's Day. Now, five more, and I got four, four minutes to do this. Honor father and mother. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. So those of you who are children and still living at home, listen. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. In other words, this is the only commandment of the ten that's repeated in the New Testament that says, if you do this, there's a promise attached to it. So if you want to live long, obey your parents. <laughs> that's what it says. That it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So the first First place discipleship needs to take place is in our homes. And parents have that responsibility to raise your children in the word and to model it just like my parents did with me. Number six, or number, uh, yeah, number six, do not murder. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. 1 John 3, 14 and 15. And Matthew 5, 21 and 22. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Number seven, do not commit adultery. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right eye causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you... You lose one of your members, then that your whole body go into hell. What's interesting about all these commandments, especially when Jesus talks about them, is he doesn't focus on the external act or the outer act. He focuses on the heart. And he says what's going on in, inside, the foundation for why you do, do what you do, should be out of love for me. And if you don't love me, then you will break these commandments again and again. Do not steal. This is interesting because... He, he puts a spin on this in 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 to 12, because he says, anyone is not willing to work, so the opposite of stealing is working. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. 
For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busybodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. And that Ephesians 4.28 passage, which we're going to look at blatantly, says don't steal. Number nine, do not bear false witness. Colossians 3, 9 through 10, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Colossians 3, 9 and 10. Ephesians 4, 25 to 29, therefore having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Ephesians 4, 25 and 29. And so in all these New Testament commands or versions of the Old Testament, it says what not to do, but it also says what to do. So when we speak, instead of lying to each other, we tell the truth to each other, but we also want to build each other up. Instead of stealing, we want to work hard. Why do we want to work hard? So we can help others in need. Every commandment is designed to love God and love your neighbor. In other words, it's for the good and the flourishing of humanity. And here's what I want to say. Even if Christianity wasn't true, if all of us did all these things, just think how good everything would be. The problem is we can't. We can't do this in and of ourselves. We need the help of God. And people need to be saved in order to be able to carry this out. But I also want you to know that our world opposes all of this. And that's why the world is a mess. The starting point isn't God. The glory of God is not an issue. And narcissism and selfishness reigns. And thus you have chaos. Amen? Okay, it's just the way it is. Okay, the last thing, do not covet, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness might not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Ephesians 5, 3, and he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully, and he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And I want to close with this from Warren Wiersbe. He says, in these summaries of the law in the New Testament, not one of them mentions the Sabbath. And we see that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Romans. Of course, the new commandment of love is the basic motivation for the Christian today. This love is shed abroad from our hearts by the Spirit, so that we love God and others and therefore should need no external law to control our lives. The old nature knows no law. And the new nature needs no law. The Sabbath was God's special day for the Jews under the old covenant. The Lord's day is God's special day for the church under the new covenant. The Sabbath symbolizes salvation by works, but specifically the works of Christ. It's all a type that points to the works that Christ would do for us. Six days of labor and then rest, the Lord's day symbolizes salvation by grace through Christ. We're able to worship him and serve him and be like him because of his grace that saved us through faith in him. So first rest and then the works follow. The Sabbath, the sacrifices, the dietary laws, the priesthood, and the tabernacle services were all done away in Christ. And what it says in the book of Hebrews is that the law has been nullified by the works of Christ. So when we take communion right now, what we're doing is we're saying, I couldn't obey the law. I can't obey the law perfectly. I can't get to heaven on my own. And so God, thank you for making provision for me by sending Jesus to be the perfect one who obeyed the law perfectly on my behalf 
was punished for my sins on the cross, and he gives me all his righteousness, all his obedience in exchange for my sin so that I could be, I, I was not only created and fallen, but I can be redeemed and I can be restored. And that can only happen through repentance of your sin and faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior. So everybody who's done that, you've repented of your sin and put your trust in Christ, I invite you to join me in taking first of the bread. And in this little wafer that represents the body of Christ, we remember that Jesus fulfilled the law that we could never fulfill. He obeyed it perfectly. And he gives me if I've repented of my sin and put my trust in all his righteousness so that I could be restored and redeemed forever. Let's take of the bread. And then Jesus also went to the cross for our sins. He died on the cross. He paid the penalty that our sins deserved. And he tells us to, as often as we gather together, when we drink in remembrance of him, we're saying we're in the new covenant. And the new covenant is we're saved by grace alone through faith in Christ alone. There's no other way. Jesus paid it all, as we sang earlier, all to him we owe. Let's pray before the worship team leads us in a final song. God, there is a lot of information here today. But one thing that I hope just stands out is for all of us is just an appreciation to you for not uh, just creating us and then having us fall and then that was it. We thank you that the bulk of the Bible isn't about creation and it's not even about fallenness. It's really about how to be redeemed and how to be restored. And so Lord, I pray for everybody here that they would truly know you personally and want to live for you because they understand what, what you have done for them and what you've saved them from and what you've saved them unto. And Lord, I pray that we would be holy, not because we're, we have to be holy or we're told to be holy, but that because we want to be holy. We want to be set apart for you. We want to be pure. We want to be used. We don't want to be controlled or in bondage to sin. We want to be liberated from that. And so, Lord, you've given us your law, which reveals what you're like and your character, and it works. When we do things your way, it just works. And so, Lord, I pray that we would do things your way and that it would be well-pleasing to you and you would use us for that which will last forever, for your kingdom and your glory. And everybody said, amen. Thank you, David. We're going to sing a song I can virtually guarantee none of you know. Um, none of us knew this song before we started rehearsing it. I think David knows it because he's the one who picked it. Um, we gave a, a list of songs about heaven uh, to her, and, and so today we're going to learn a song called In a Little While. It's, um, it's an encouragement. Um, you could live to be 150, but it's just a little while in comparison to what heaven is. Um, so it's, it's an encouragement that there's going to be a time, no more tears, just all the promises of heaven. Also, I love the line about... Um, we will gaze, we'll see your face with our own eyes. We will gaze on your glory, full on your glory, and never have to look away. I think of Moses, who wanted to see God, you know, on the mountain, and God wouldn't let him. He said it would kill you. So he was allowed to see him kind of as he passed behind, and, the, and he glowed for, I don't know how long afterwards, just seeing the passing of God. Um, then we get to see him face to face. What an amazing thing. We're going to stand together. Be patient. It's a good song. Well, most of us have said, you know what? I didn't like this song at first, and now I'm finding myself humming it all week long. So <laughs> we're about to give you an earworm of praise. Here we go. One, two, three, four. <laughs>
be over In a little while the night will be past They'll be singing, they'll be dancing and laughter And we will see the sun at last And we will see your face with our See, now you're going to be humming that all the way home. Um, we're going to pray now, but also uh, there'll be people up here in front if you want to be able to see God with your own eyes. Come forward. Those people are willing to talk to you about whatever you need prayer for. Uh, so uh, let's close here, but uh, do, do, do come forward. God bless you. Lord, we thank you so much. You are eternal. And all of this does just seem such a little while. We know that a day, a thousand years is like a day to you. It's, it doesn't, uh, in your eternity, Lord, it's just such a short thing. And we're going to spend an eternity one place or another, one with you or one without you, uh, or one in uh, a place of your wrath or a place of your glory and grace. Lord, I pray we all choose to, to meet with you in glory and grace and love. Lord, bless us as we go and, uh, and those that need prayer afterwards too. Uh, thank you, Lord. And we praise your name in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>